Welcome to Living Outside the Matrix, the show for thinking people where we explode the many modern myths within the matrix by questioning the important issues within the mainstream narrative. Hi there, I'm your host, Nigel Howitt, and on the show today, we're going to bust some major myths, and it's a great pleasure to be joined in doing this by Yaron Brook. For those of you who don't know um, who he is, Yaron was, uh, is an Israeli-born American citizen. He's uh, an objectivist, uh, an entrepreneur, and a writer who rose to become executive uh, director of the Ayn Rand Institute, I think until last year. Perhaps you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Yaron... Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and welcome to the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Great. Perhaps you could start, um, Yaron, by giving us a, a, a sort of a brief how you got from growing up in Israel to California and heading the Ayn Rand Institute. Sure. I mean, w when I was 16 uh, in Israel, uh, yeah, I think about like most Israelis uh, at the time in the 1970s, I was a committed socialist and a committed collectivist. Uh, and a friend of mine gave me a copy of Atlas Shrugged to read, and uh, the book uh, changed my life completely. It changed uh, my ideas, changed the way I looked at the world. And really, from the age of 16, I became committed to studying and understanding the ideas of, uh, of Ayn Rand while pursuing other careers. I, I was uh, in the Israeli army, then I was... Uh, I got an undergraduate in uh, civil engineering, but all while doing this, um, uh, you know, studying and interested in engaging with, with Ayn Rand's philosophy of object objectivism. I moved to the U.S. in 2000, uh, no, 1987 and uh, got my MBA and PhD at the University of Texas in Austin. At the same time, contacted the Ayn Rand Institute, took some courses with them, some classes on the philosophy, got, got involved in some of the, in the conference in putting on conferences on objectivism, got to know all the people engaged and involved. And ultimately in 2000, they, uh, they came to me and offered me the job of uh, executive director of the Institute. And today, today I'm no longer there, but I'm, I'm still chairman of the board at, at ARI. Fantastic. Well, nice one. Well, perhaps you could um, give uh, the listeners and everybody just, a, a, again, a, quite a, a brief sort of um, introduction on Ayn Rand, um, who she was and, you know, her philosophy in a nutshell, so we can sure. proceed from there. Sure. I mean, I, Rand was born in 1905 in Russia, so she she witnessed the Russian Revolution. She lived under communism in her teen years and her early 20s. Uh, it was obvious to her and to her family and everybody who knew her that she couldn't stay, that if she stayed, they would kill her. Uh, she was a real independent thinker. She was an individualist in a world of of communism and collectivism. And uh, so at the earliest opportunities in the 1920s, there was a small window of opportunity where Lenin was allowing people to leave uh, for particular, for study and things like that. She, she managed to get a visa to go to the United States uh, where she had relatives in Chicago. She, she moved to the US, went to Hollywood, uh, started out you know, at the bottom basically, and, and really through hard work and studying English, rose up through Hollywood to become a script writer. At the same time, she was writing plays, uh, writing uh, novels. She wrote a novel called We the Living in the 1930s that was about life under communism. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the intelligentsia in America rejected it because it was too anti-communist and they were all very pro-communist at the time. And then uh, she wrote a, 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 her most famous book, um, uh, the Fountainhead, which 12 publishers rejected and uh, ultimately the 13th accepted. And when uh, when it was accepted, uh, it became a word of mouth bestseller uh, and, and sold, uh, you know, many, many copies. She ultimately moved to New York uh, and, and lived in New York the rest of her life. She then wrote what's considered a magnus opus, Atlas Shrugged, which was published in 1957. Uh, publishers competed for that book. They all wanted to publish it because The Fountainhead had been such a success. And uh, both books, uh, Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, still sell hundreds of thousands of copies today. Uh, they still would be on bestseller lists if they counted old books. It's, it's truly stunning how well they have done, given how old they are. And then in the 60s and 70s, Rand really devoted herself to writing nonfiction, to writing her philosophical works. And you can, uh, you know, those are still in, all still in print. Everything she's written is still in print. Uh, you can get... Uh, you know, the, the virtue of selfishness, capitalism, the unknown ideal, 
uh, uh, Philosophy Who Needs It. All these books are available in, in most British bookstores, in most American bookstores. They're certainly available from Amazon, uh, where she wrote her philosophy. So that's kind of it. She died in uh, 1982, and the Ironman Institute was established in 1985. So that's kind of a biography. Um, in terms of her ideas, I mean, she said that her philosophy, in essence, was man as a heroic being. And, and she very much uh, she very much took as her goal, a philosophical goal is is to understand what true heroism, what a true heroic man is. And she needed that because that's what she portrays in her books. And she felt like no philosophy out there really had a proper conception of human beings, of, 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 of a heroic man. So really, everything is centered around that idea, the idea that we are. We are beings uh, of reason, of rational mind, that are capable of knowing reality as it is. Reality is not invented by a super being. It's not invented by our consciousness. It's not invented by our emotions. Uh, it is what it is. A is A. We have the capacity to know it through reason uh, and uh, not through emotions, not through mystical revelation, but through a reasoning mind. And that only individuals reason and the purpose of morality should be the flourishing of the individual. So, so your purpose in your life should be survival qua human being, should be ultimately to be happy. And that the only political system that allows people to pursue their values, their rational values in pursuit of their happiness is capitalism, or in other words, freedom. Uh, she, so she was against any government involvement in the economy. The only role of government was to protect individual rights. Uh, no government involvement in, in individuals' lives, other than to protect us from crooks and criminals and fraudsters. That's it. Okay, great stuff. So that gives us a broad overview. Um, <clears throat> just to add some context at this end, um, to explain to, to you and uh, some of the viewers who don't know the, the, the metaphor that I use here that about the Matrix, living outside the Matrix, and how that ties in with, with Ayn Rand. Uh, the Matrix film and story, for anybody that doesn't know, is a, a trilogy that kicks off in 1999, with the Wachowski Brothers film starring Keanu Reeves as this character Neo and it portrays a dystopian world where the vast majority of human beings are um, um, living in a dream world, they're controlled and exploited and this character Neo uh, meets with a, a band um, that persuade him to leave the Matrix and in this process he's offered a choice, he's offered the red pill or the blue pill and the blue pill represents just going back to sleep waking up the next day you know don't worry believe whatever you want and the red pill represents i want to know it represents seeking to know to connect with reality and find out the truth of the way things are so neo proactively takes this step in wanting to know and there, there's also the uh, the metaphor in there that he's the one he's the uh, it could be viewed as the savior and supporting you know the idea of helplessness but i prefer to think of him as the one the the i the, uh, the individual and uh, who takes responsibility. So, so this metaphor has obviously a lot of parallels in, in modern life and, and I consider the, the matrix out there in reality to, to kind of be most things in the mainstream, the group think, if you like, the, um, it's the package deal download of cultural assumptions that, uh, that people buy into before they've really sat down and considered things themselves. So this is the context, this is why this whole lifestyle, living outside the matrix. And to tie that into Ayn Rand, I discovered Ayn Rand, you're on just a few years ago, unfortunately. I always wish I'd discovered her earlier in life. Um, and I found that her philosophy of reason to be an immensely powerful tool for finding truth. And it seems to be something that escapes a lot of the, you know, the so-called truth movement. But getting to the nitty gritty of identifying reality, that which is true, Ayn Rand's philosophy is is spot on. I mean, as you said, it's the it's well, it's the only philosophy that, that I know of that, that does that. Yep. So that sort of ties things in. So I I, I explore all these myths in the the uh, in the mainstream to to try and shatter the untruth and connect us all back to reality so that we can thrive essentially and there, there are so many myths and um, there's a list of them on the website in fact uh, um, www.lawforrebel.com anyone who's interested go there but uh, things such as you know money is the root of all evil that saturated fat makes you fat that mercury amalgam fillings are safe in your mouth you could go on and on and on and the important point is that all of these myths if you buy into them they have a destructive effect on, on our lives due to the cause and effect nature of reality obviously 
So Ayn Rand's philosophy, absolutely fantastic for exploding myths. So you're on, um, having said that, um, there are some really fundamental myths out there, such as socialism being a good thing. So, yep. so you're very uh, well versed on this. That the myth out there is that, yeah, being a bit left wing, you, you you care, you might be a bit arty, you're all for sharing things out, and it's got this it's got this uh, general belief in the minds of anybody who hasn't really analysed what it is that it's a good thing. So maybe we can explode that perhaps first by defining socialism and then going on to give us, you know, its real nature. Sure. I mean, there, there are a variety of different ways to define socialism, but, you know, but basically socialism is the idea that the state should own the means of production or in other words, the state um, as, as, a, as a collectivistic entity is the primary, the individual is secondary and the purpose of the individual is to serve that state. The particular form in which that takes under socialism is we're supposed to help the poor and we don't trust business and we don't trust corporations and we don't trust the profit motive. So we have to take away the profit motive and we take away the profit motive by, uh, in a sense, socializing, uh, whether it's by in the moderate form of socialism, we regulate the hell out of them and we tax them as much as we can in a more consistent form of socialism. We actually, the state actually nationalizes, you know, what uh, what uh, Corbyn would like to do is nationalize many of the industries. So you take out the profit motive completely because now so, so-called the, the state, the, the collective uh, uh, governs everything. So uh, that's the that's the idea of socialism. It's supposed to be all about sharing. And, it, you know, if you take it, it's supposed to be to each according to his uh, to each according to his needs, from each according to his abilities. So if you're really able, uh, you should be willing to sacrifice more for those who are not able. And it's really uh, an entire philosophy built about individual sacrifice for the so-called greater good, whatever the hell that is. Um, you know, and again, there are many forms. Uh, there are many forms of the same kind of idea. So they're all, I, I would group them all under the idea of statism, which that is, the idea of the state being so I don't consider socialism and fascism and communism that different. I think they're all variations on the same thing, uh, which shocks the socialists because they think that the, they think that the opposite of fascists, which in, indeed they're, they're very, very similar to fascists, they're just a, a slightly different variation of fascism. OK, so, um, so to be clear, they're all forms of statism, the fascism, all communism. Of statism, which says that the state is superior to the individual, the group, the collective, the, 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 the common good, the public interest, any of these kind of catchphrases that everybody uses as if they mean something, that is, is more important than the life of the individual. And it's okay to sacrifice individuals to various degrees, anywhere from, you know, obviously concentration camps all the way to taxing them at 50, 60 percent and taking away their time and enslaving their labor in a sense to, 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 to the, uh, to the collective, any one of those variations is is uh, is okay. It's okay to sacrifice the individual for the sake of the group, for the sake of those who don't have, for the sake of those who need. Uh, you know, so that is that is the common denominator among all of them: the the, the disregard for the individual and the veneration of the group. Okay, um, and that's fundamentally illogical, really, isn't it? Because because the group, uh, solely being an abstract concept, it has no actual form it is only made up of individuals the the individual is the uh, unit of, of of humanity really isn't it yes yeah, so the, so the, so the group is just a collection of individuals uh, so so there's a there's a purpose to thinking it about groups because it helps it's an abstraction you know you see a large number of individuals you call that a group and 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 suddenly some activities we engage in we engage in in groups i don't know a soccer team that's a team that's a group um uh, football, I shouldn't say soccer when we couldn't. So, um, but it's, um, but the fact is that the unit, the unit in reality, the unit that eats, the unit that sleeps, the unit that thinks, the unit that knows is the individual. And therefore, the, the, the uh, you know, Ayn Rand would argue, I would argue, reality would argue that the, the fundamental metaphysical unit in reality is the individual. It is his life that matters. It, it, it is his life that, that, that's, uh, that needs to be protected. It is his life that he is responsible for nourishing and, and, and fulfilling. Now, uh, part of the funny thing about socialism is that 
it's it's a massive failure, right? It, at everywhere it's tried, to any degree that it's tried, it is a it is a massive failure, and there are really no examples of of socialism being successful, and yet it is venerated as this ideal. And I think it's venerated as an ideal because of something even more insidious underneath it all, which makes socialism and fascism and all these other statist ideas possible. And that is the idea of altruism, the idea that morally the purpose of the individual is to sacrifice for the group. The purpose of the individual is to sacrifice for others, Mm -hmm. for those in need. And and so altruism, uh, as Augustine Comte defined it as as this negation of self that you know to be truly selfless never think about yourself even when helping somebody else make sure you're not doing it because it makes you feel good make sure you're not doing it because you think it'll buy you into heaven make sure you're not doing it for any self-interested so-called cause Uh, you know that idea has been ingrained in us i think christianity and and secular philosophy certainly since immanuel kant has ingrained that idea that the purpose of life is to serve others. That is nobility. Mm. That is, none of us want to do it. None of us actually live that way. But we mm. all admire Mother Teresa, and we think that's an ideal. Sure. And then you think about what is the political manifestation of that. The political manifestation of that is the system that says, yeah, you're too selfish to be truly altruistic, so we're going to force it on you. We're going to create a political system that it forces you to, to serve the needy, that forces you to sacrifice. And that sure. is really socialism. I, I think also, I mean, we've, we've jumped ahead to, uh, to another myth because I wanted to look at, uh, at altruism, but that's, it's, that's fine because these all, these, it, it, these it, all, absolutely, they all interrelate. Um, capitalism is on the list as well. Sure. Um, so, so the idea that, that, that I think also altruism helps sort of um, soften people up to 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 offering up themselves, doesn't it? To present that as an ideal, it yeah. tends to ready people for any form of abuse and and uh, and suffering. And so, I think that's right. And I think religion understood that a long, long time ago, and and really tribal lords understood that a long, long time ago, that if you want to control people then the best way to control people is to tell them that they're not that th- th- their responsibility in life is not to themselves, not to their mind, not to their well-being, but the purpose of their life is to serve others. And how do we know what others need? Well, we know what others need because the great leader tells us what other needs. Uh, you know, that whether it's the political leader, whether it's the witch doctor or the pope or the priest or whatever, uh, they know what's good for the people. And they are the ones who then convey that knowledge to us and then our job is to go and sacrifice for them this is i think uh, how tribalism uh, uh, you know really held on to people and why we didn't break out of tribalism much earlier in our evolution and i also think it is how religion uh, took control and and, uh, and and controlled people for so long and i think ultimately it's how uh, kings and, uh, and and tribal leaders and any any form of authoritarianism holds on to us. It says your mind is impotent and anyway, you shouldn't be living for yourself. So since you can know the truth and since you shouldn't be living for yourself anyway, you need me to guide you in service to others. And I commune with God or I commune with the Aryan race or I commune with the proletarian or I commune with fill in the blank, the English people, the British, you know, the white, whatever. I commune with the group and I'll tell you how to live. And um, and that's that's the the secret source for all authoritarians, and we buy into it because we've been convinced by this altruism, and it, again it ties in. We've been convinced by the idea that reason is impotent. All these ideas are connected, right? Altruism depends on the idea that reason is ultimately impotent, because if we all can reason, we don't need the supreme leader, and we don't need to lift other people. They can live for themselves, and we can live for ourselves. You know what's the problem, right? Sure. So. So all of these are necessary in order to impose on us a myth of statism. Statism is one form of authoritarianism, of socialism, where we all are supposed to uh, sacrifice for the poor. The government, the political leaders are going to tell us how that sacrifice is going to manifest itself. Who are the winners? Who are the losers? Who gets to do what? How you get to live your life? What you get to do with your money? They ultimately dictate our lives because they are in touch with the world of spirits. They're in touch with the truth. The truth is not available to any of us, so we don't know who to sacrifice to. They will guide us in our sacrifice. Yeah, and I think also um, 
socialism feeds into that uh, desire to be looked after, doesn't it? It's sort of with, with the idea of the welfare state, which, again, on the face of it, sounds all well and good. It sounds nice that we should help our fellow man. But of course, we know that we that's what humans do anyway. I mean, you, I and everybody, of course, we help people when, when they're needed. But the idea of this welfare state seems to feed into um, the, 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 the sort of the, the parasite class the, the you don't have to it kind of rewards yeah, inactivity doesn't it yeah but i would also challenge the idea with we help people i mean look i don't help everybody i mean i help who i want to help and i help people who i think are deserving of help and the fact is not everybody's deserving of help there are people out there who don't deserve my help who who should rot right and 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 they deserve it because they're they're irrational and because they they're not productive because they don't take care of themselves they're fully capable because they you know i i call it the wife beating drunk doesn't deserve my help you know he, he's run in hell that's what he deserves and uh, and the problem with part of one of the problems with the welfare state is that it doesn't differentiate everybody gets help whether they deserve it or whether they don't whether it's help to get them up on their feet so they can go and work ultimately or whether it's somebody who's never going to work, who never doesn't want to work, who wants to exploit the system and just, just it's, it live like a bum. So it, the welfare state doesn't discriminate. Private charity, I think, would discriminate because its donors would demand that it discriminates. I wouldn't give money to a, a charity that didn't discriminate between the worthy poor and the unworthy poor. Some people, are not, you know, they're unworthy in, in every category uh, of, of humanity. So I believe in justice. I believe in judging. I believe in, in not treating everybody the same, no matter whether they're needy or not needy. I'm willing to help people, but, but I, I want to at least believe that they're innocent uh, b before I help them. Or, but if I know that they're not, I'm not interested in helping them. Um, but, but yes, I think part of, the, uh, part of the attraction of socialism is to those people who don't want to work. But of course, this is a self-perpetuating thing. What socialism does and what the welfare state does is it grows that group, right? It tells people you're incompetent, you can't take care of yourself, you don't have a mind, don't worry, be happy, we're going to take care of you. Of course, they can't be happy because they're not being productive and they're not really engaging with the world. They're just getting a check from the government. Don't worry, we'll give you. And of course, if, if the group originally that really needs help is very small, the welfare sp state keeps expanding that group and expanding that group and expanding that group to the point where today the welfare state funds many things at the middle class, like, you know, health care and, uh, and uh, Social Security, all things the middle class could take care of themselves. There's actually no problem of them taking care of that. But the welfare state has expanded and expanded to the point where the middle class doesn't want it. You know, if I say anything negative about the NHS in, in the U.K., you know, it's like I'm a child murderer. You know, I'm, I'm immediately condemned. It's it's the it's a real holy grail, and of course, the NHS is just a dumbing down of the middle class, and and it, providing them with an inferior product in the name of, don't think about it, don't make an effort, we'll take care of it, don't worry about it, and that's what the welfare state does, and it, it continuously expands to take over more and more of our lives. And it, and, and it impacts more and more people. And it's a dumbing down, motivating down, creating dependence on the state as much as possible, because that's what gives them power is our dependence on. Sure. And so, so the, the ultimate proof, if you like, that so socialism is a myth, as you alluded to earlier, um, lies in, in the statistics of, of, of the millions of people that died at the hands of socialist um, regimes, should we call them, um, in the last century. I'm sure you've got some statistics on that. But w would you say that's the ultimate proof? Um, obviously, we're talking about sacrificing individuals to, to the group. You're talking about the loss of human life. Yeah. What, and, and also from there, why is it in the, in the, in the face of that weighty evidence, do you think that <laughs> this myth still perpetuates? <laughs> So to me, the ultimate truth is is the the fact that groups don't exist, that the individual is the only thing that exists, and therefore the individual is responsible for their own lives. The ultimate truth is the fact that we do have reason and we can't cope and we can't flourish and we can be successful as individuals and we don't need to be mothered and, and pampered by by the state and by others. The, the that is the the ultimate truth is how how horribly unhappy uh, people on welfare really are. But on top of that, we have this huge amount of evidence that everywhere socialism is tried, it has failed. Everywhere socialism is tried, and the more consistently it is tried, death and destruction follow, 
whether it's starvation in Venezuela and, you know, right now, right now, as we're talking, people are starving to death in Venezuela. Little babies are dying of malnourishment in Venezuela. Venezuela that 30 years ago was one of the richest, was the richest country in Latin America. Venezuela has more oil reserves than, than Saudi Arabia. It's, it should be one of the richest countries on the planet. It has fertile land. It used to export food, but because of collectivized farming, because of the nationalization of oil, the entire oil industry, because of the, of the, of the government attempt to control every aspect of the economy, that economy today has inflation, I think, something like 10,000%. It is, people are literally, and it's it's a crime that our media is not reporting this, literally starving, uh, and, and, and people are being murdered. Uh, the crime rate in Venezuela has gone through the roof, and most of those crimes, I think, or much of those crimes are committed by uh, uh, forces aligned with the Venezuelan government. Uh, and that's happening right now, but but it's it, that is that was true of communism. That is true of every attempt to inflict any form of socialism. It's true to some extent, not to that extreme, because it was never practiced that extremely. But in 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 the UK in the 1960s and 1970s, when the when the when uh, when the UK uh, flirted with socialism, when uh, industries were nationalized, when the labor unions were all powerful, uh, when the state was everything, before Margaret Thatcher kind of dismantled much of that, or, or some of it. UK was horrible. There was a massive brain drain. People were leaving. Anybody with 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 smarts was leaving. And there were stories in the, all the British papers about the brain drain because nobody wanted to live under such conditions. London was dark and filthy and horrible. Uh, you, you you couldn't find uh, you know many goods in London stores. Uh, you know, to compare London today to London of the 1970s is like night and day. It's it's incomparable. London, in comparison today, is a beautiful, robust, energetic, dynamic city. Back then, it was the pits. It was awful, and 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 the UK was in horrible condition. People were relatively poor. Uh, today, the UK is one of the wealthiest uh, countries in the world. So. You know, the differences are vast, and yet people don't learn from those differences. Israel, when it was socialist, when I was uh, when I was living there, it was relatively poor. Uh, today, as it's freed up its economy and introduced more elements of free markets, Israel is a robust, relatively wealthy, successful economy. Um, everywhere, everywhere. Sweden, when it took socialism, everybody uses Sweden as the example. Sweden, when it took socialism seriously from the 60s through the 90s, uh, became poor. It used to be the richest country in Europe. It, it slowly deteriorated. By 1994, the Swedish government was basically bankrupt. It had lost all its major industries. Uh, it, it was really, Sweden was struggling in the early 1990s. And the fact is that since the 90s, early 90s till today, the Swedish government has shrunk the role of government, shrunk government spending, shrunk social programs, and, and shrunk government intervention in the economy. And as a consequence of all that, of moving towards more free markets, the Swedish economy has recovered and doing better. Uh, it still redistributes way too much wealth. But in terms of relative to the America, for example, it regulates business far less than America does. Uh, and it's as economically free as the United States of America. So. Sweden is not, to the extent that it's successful, is not socialist. When it was more socialist, it was failing. Sure. Okay. Well, maybe we can uh, move it on to capitalism. And again, this conversation is going to uh, everything is going to tie in together. Um, let, can we um, define capitalism? Because there's a major myth out there that capitalism is the bad guy. It's all about fat cats and greed. And if you're a capitalist, you're, you're evil. So, so let's try and dismantle that one a bit. I mean, the essence of capitalism, as I understand it, is, is a social system that's, that's based on recognition of, of individual rights. Uh, particularly uh, property rights and and where the individual owns uh, um, the means of production and um, and there's no uh, regulation by any coercive um, authority such as government it's really a system of freedom yeah. it's individual it's it's a system of individual freedom freedom from coercion freedom for force freedom for authority it's a system that recognizes the individual's right to live his life as he sees fit to pursue the rational values necessary for his own survival neither you know, violating other people's rights and not allowing other people right to, 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 to violate his rights. And this, the role of the state is limited to protecting the rights of individuals, to protect us from 
uh, shooting each other, killing each other, uh, hurting each other uh, through physical violence or, or committing fraud. And that's pretty much it. So a military, a police and a judiciary system. It's the system that takes the idea of individual freedom seriously. It's a system that takes the idea of the efficacy of human reason seriously. It's the idea that every individual out there, poor, rich, middle class, can take care of themselves, can work for a living, can make it, make it so that they can it, you know, do well in this world. Not equally. It's not about equality at all because we're not equal. We're not born equal. We're not raised equal. We're just not equal. We don't have the same moral character. We don't have anything uh, equal about us. So the results are going to be when you leave us free, the results are going to be unequal. But it really is the system that leaves us free, it leaves us free to live based on our values, based on our principles, based on using our individual minds. Uh, and um, it, it, so it's, it's you know, I, I, I think of it as the only system that actually takes the idea of, of freedom seriously. Sure. And it uh, rewards productivity, doesn't it? It rewards thinking. It rewards reason. Um, well, I mean, thinking and reason are rewarded in a sense by reality. All it does is leave you alone. And then the question is, what happens when you're left alone? It protects your property rights. It protects your right to act. And what happens when you're left alone is that if you produce values and if you if, if other people value the values that you're producing, then you can make a lot of money and, and you get to keep that money because it's yours because you created it and it's nobody else's business what you create. If you uh, but you, it also lets you fail. And, and if, if you start, do a startup in Silicon Valley and it doesn't work, like 99 percent of them don't work, you fail. And if you if you if you if you have the right kind of character, then you learn from that failure and you rise up and you try again and you do something different. The point of capitalism is, is that it it is a system of justice. That is, if you really create values, and pe- it, it, then you're going to do well. And if you don't create values, you won't do well. And hopefully you'll learn from it and you start creating real values and you'll figure out what, 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 you know, what works and what doesn't work. It's a system connected to reality and to, and to the, the, the wants and, and, or the, the capacities of other people to, to consume. So uh, if you do something that you think is a great value, but no, you can't convince anybody else, then, then you're not going to make any money. But if you're like Steve Jobs and you produce something without asking anybody what they want. But if you produce something that people really do want, that people really do need, and you can show them why they want it and why they need it, then you can become a billionaire. There's no limit. The only limit is what you produce, what you create, the values that you, you know, put out there into the world that you produce. And um, so it's a system of justice. It's a system of reality. It's a system that leaves individuals free to pursue their lives as they see fit, to flourish to, uh, to use their minds to achieve their individual flourishing. And sure. at the end of the day, I think, I, I think overall people are, are happier, more successful, more prosperous, richer. Uh, uh, you know, material well-being is unbelievably better because all the incentives are right. Alive. Sure. I mean, in that, in that sense, again, the, the evidence parked in reality is that, is that capitalism works brilliantly, doesn't it? And you, you've just outlined, you know, the, the, the sort of moral case and the, 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 what, why it's, uh, it works. And, and yet it still, it still persists. You know, I, I speak to people all the time that, uh, that still, um, you know, implicitly when their actions and some of the things they say, they give away the fact that they still think that uh, capitalism is this great big uh, evil. Um, do, you, do you think that's just down to this, the, the socialist um, or, or the propaganda, the, the false messages deliberately put out? It's about the altruism. It really is. So okay. if, let's bring that back in then, the altruism, because because uh, the other myth I wanted to, uh, it's actually, I wanted to separate it, but the myth that, that, that self-sacrifice, um, altruism is good, that, that denying yourself to help somebody else is good versus, you know, and also it's cor- corollary, the, the myth that the self-interest is evil. The fact that if you if you rationally take care of your own stuff, if you look after yourself and your and your kin, that that's somehow bad. So maybe we can pull that up, that apart as well. Sure. So so um, I mean, the idea of self-sacrifice, the idea that taking care of others at your own expense, at the expense of those that you love is a good thing. I mean, the way to explode that is to ask a very simple question. Why? Why should I self-sacrifice? Why is their happiness more important than my happiness? Why is their life more important than my life? 
why isn't my life to me more important given that I'm living it? I have one shot at this life. It's my life. You'd think that that would be the most important thing to me. And indeed it is. Logically so, yeah. Yeah, so this is just simple logic. So the whole idea of altruism is to deny the self. It's to destroy the individual. And of course, capitalism relies on the individual. It relies on individualism. It relies on you pursuing your own values and you wanting to pursue your own values and believing that your values are worth pursuing. Altruism undercuts that. Altruism nullifies that. It tells you, no, you are worthless. Your only purpose in life is to serve other people. You And indeed, it associates self-interest and it, it, it really ingrains in people's minds that self-interest equals lying, cheating, stealing, exploiting, raping, pillaging. That's real self-interest, right? And uh, the only alternative in more, the only alternative in life is either to be a lying, cheating, stealing SOB or to self-sacrifice. And what I and really says, this is a genius. He says, wait a minute. That, that's a false dichotomy. There's a third alternative. And that the third alternative is to live for yourself, rationally pursuing your values. And it turns out that if you think that through, what's really good for me. It's not good for me to lie. It's not good for me to cheat. It's not good for me to plunder and so on. All those things are actually destructive to me as an individual. And certainly to live in a society in which that's allowed is destructive. So capitalism is not a system of exploitation. It's not a system of uh, lying, cheating, stealing. It's quite the contrary. It's the system. But that's what people are convinced it is. People are taught because of altruism. It's a system of self-interest. Now, that's true. Capitalism is the system of self-interest. But then they go, but self-interest is lying, cheating, stealing, being an SOB. So it is the system of lying, cheating, stealing, and being SOB. And that's what they associate with capitalism. It's Bernie Madoff. It's cheats. It's crooks. It's criminals. And I say, well, no, 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 no. Capitalism is a system of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and, 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 and Sam Walton and, uh, you know, and, and great scientists and great engineers and great producers and great creators and great thinkers. That's the essence of capitalism. It's the production of values. It's individuals pursuing their own happiness by producing, by creating. Sure. So I suppose the, the reason comes in here when, when we when we add the concept of reason to self-interest, we suddenly shift it, don't we? We, we suddenly pull it out of that false dichotomy. Um, Absolutely. All, all of a sudden, it's self-interest is not about exploiting somebody else, because as you point out, my rational, my, yours, everybody's rational self-interest involves getting on with people, offering value, trading, um, you know, helping out occasionally, perhaps. Uh, yep. all, all of these things are encompassed within within that framework of, of reason that uh, Ayn Rand so, so beautifully uh, brought I mean, Rand it. would say there's no such thing as self-interest other than rational self-interest. Sure. Because as a biological being, the way in which human beings survive the way in which we thrive, the thing that leads to success and flourishing and happiness for a human being is our reason. And you, when you divorce reason from the individual, you divorce the individual from his self-interest. So my self-interest is to be to use my reason because that is what evolution has given me as my means of survival, as my means of success. It what allows me to rise above the animal state. It's what allows me to flourish and be happy qua human being. Sure. And this kind of ties into another myth, the myth of subjectivism, because uh, it's a widespread myth out there. And I, I must admit, I subscribed to it for a number of years that, that we create our own reality. This this new age mystical idea um, that that somehow we can we can shape things actually in reality through through our power of intention and, and thinking. And, and what fascinates me, Iran, is that is that the way a lot of people implicitly demonstrate in our everyday life that we accept that reality is an absolute an objective absolute and yet we have other behaviors and and we subscribe to these ideas that are that are subjectivist that are actually in complete antagonism of the, the two ideas contradict each other yep. <laughs> what's and, going and on there this is the power of philosophy you know philosophy is a very very powerful thing uh, ideas are very very powerful things and all human beings need philosophy whether they know it or not, whether they recognize it or not, whether they study or not, all individuals need philosophy. And what Ayn Rand teaches us is that if you don't study it, if you don't identify it, if you don't adopt a particular philosophy consciously through study, 
you will just absorb philosophy by osmosis from the world around you. And it'll never be integrated and it'll be full of contradictions. It'll Welcome be to the matrix. Your said and your teacher says and your neighbor says, and you'll be full of contradictions. So it doesn't surprise me at all when I see people living contradictions because that's exactly what happens when you don't actually use reason to define your own philosophy in a thoughtful, purposefully, purposeful kind of way. So, yes, I mean, people are very careful in the way they cross the street. But if you're a real subjectivist and you believe you're creating reality, then the car coming towards you is not really there. And you should be able to will it away and you should be able to cross right in front of it and, and it not hitting you. But, of course, nobody, even even the biggest mystic, uh, it doesn't doesn't actually believe that. Um, and but but I know a lot of people who believe, oh, no, but but. We're subjectivists when it comes to our values. Our values are subjective. It's whatever I feel like. It's whatever I want. No, even that's not true. Because the fact is that human beings have a particular nature. Everything has a nature. Everything has a, a is a. It, it, you know, the, the law of identity and the law of causality hold. Things act based on their nature. And to understand what's good for human beings, to understand what's good for you as an individual, you have to understand your nature and your fundamental nature as a human being is a reasoning being. So what is good for you is what is rational. What is good for you can only be discovered through a process of thought. Even what food is good and what food is bad. You talked about saturated fat. Even to discover what food is good for, what food is bad for you, requires thought, requires uh, science, requires real evaluation of reality. You don't instinctually know, right? We have to, you know, unfortunately, people probably tried to poison, died. People learned from that through a scientific, in a sense, a scientific method to discover what's poison and what's not, what, what actually allows us to live long and what doesn't. We don't know instinctually any of this. So uh, you cannot discover what is good and what is true without using reason and without recognizing the reality that exists out there. You, you have to study the world to know what is good and what is bad, what what will lead to your flourishing, what will lead to your success. And you have to study human nature. Those are the two things that require study. So philosophy really should be on on the uh, the everyone's life curriculum. I mean, obviously, that's one thing that's conspicuously absent from any, any of the modern um, institutions calling themselves schooling, particularly in well, this they, country. If you think about it, religion is a poor man's substitute for philosophy. And sure. that's why everybody... Ha- almost everybody adopts religion because religion is a form of philosophical approach. It's a wrong philosophical approach, but it's people need philosophy one way or the other. Yeah. And religion has stepped in to fill that gap partially because philosophy is hard, but yes, everybody should have philosophy and, and everybody should study it to the, whatever extent they are capable of studying it. They should know that the basic principles of how to live their life, which all come from philosophy. Sure. Yeah, it's it seems uh, it seems to me that the root cause of it, uh, you know, and this is something that I got from Ayn Rand, is that really thinking is the answer. The, 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 it's the best thing you can do, because yeah. through that process of thinking and applying reason and logic, you know, you can arrive at you can expose these contradictions. And when you see a contradiction, you know, contradictions don't exist in reality. And then, then you can revise things. And, and it seems to me that that all of our problems could easily be resolved <laughs> if uh, if people could sit down and think things through. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 thinking not in a, you know, there's a false view in our culture about thinking, that it's something you do inside your head. But, but thinking, it's about observing, it's about integrating, it's about seeing the world, it's about seeking out facts and being 100% committed to facts, not emotions, not what people tell you, not opinions, but actual facts and then integrating those facts and constantly working with the material in reality and logic to discover new truth or to, to understand the world. Mm. I suppose also another myth that we could uh, touch on um, is also the, the idea that uh, emotions, you, you, you've mentioned it a couple of times now, I, I think this is a very significant um, duff steer for people where, where they might be considering an issue and the first thing they'll grab at is how they feel about it. Um, in the mistaken um, belief that somehow that's giving them some objective uh, information about that issue, and and uh, you know maybe you can speak to that because that's one of, one of Ayn Rand's core um, sure. things that she taught me was this this fantastic insight of using our emotions as as feedback as to whether or not we're we're successfully moving towards our goals. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, 
emotions are not tools of cognition. They don't tell us what is true and what is not about the world out there. Emotions tell us how we are responding automatically to things, how in a sense our subconscious is integrating the information and the knowledge that we have. That's the information that we get from emotions. Now, the, the, the more you think, the more you rely on your reason, the more consistent your emotions will become with your reason. But if you don't, your emotions are going to respond in ways you don't recognize because they are consequences of thinking you've done in the past, conclusions you've come to the past. It might be logical, it might be illogical, it might be, uh, it might be uh, rational or irrational, it might be something you, you identified when you were a child that has nothing to do with your life today, but it, that is feeding your emotions today. Ayn Rand says, recognize your emotions, identify them, think about them, try to discover where they come from, but they're not guides to action. They should not tell you what to do. That you should get from your thinking. That you should get from your cognition. You, but you want to have an integrated life where your emotion and your thinking are one. But to do that, you have to introspect. Why am I feeling this? What's causing it? Is it, ra is it right for me to feel this way? Is this emotion justified based on the fact? And if you do that, your emotions will change. And they'll change to be more in alignment with your thinking. And everybody's done this, right? So you, you, you're in love with somebody and they, uh, they do something horrible. And it, it takes a while for the emotion of love to go away, even while consciously you know that you shouldn't love them. But the more you think about it, ultimately the emotion will go away. Uh, you know, and, and we all experience it. That's why it's so hard to break up with people because it, it, your emotion wants you to stay, but your reason tells you, no, they're no good. And it takes a while for those to get aligned. The more you think about it, the more you actually focus on it, the more you get the alignment. Sure. Do you think there's anything to be said for the idea that uh, intuition or a hunch, uh, I, I see a rational uh, explanation for this as my subconscious perhaps throwing up uh, something relevant to the situation that I haven't I haven't got consciously in my mind so I, I can see that that there could be times where a hunch or what we might call intuition could actually serve me where my my conscious appraisal of the situation is inadequate but something you know within my store of knowledge in my subconscious actually says hang about <laughs> you know we've been here before so, so what do you think of that Yes, but, but again, I, I don't think one should act on it until one has more information. So let's say you meet somebody and it's somebody that's important to you. I don't know, it's a boss or it's a coworker or something like that that you're going to have to hang out with them. And your intuition says, oh, this is a bad person. You can't act on that. You, you, you have to say, okay, I, I've noted that. Now let me examine the facts and I'll, cool. I'll really make an effort to figure out what's going on with this person. Maybe it's an employee and you're deciding – you can't just act, oh, I hate this employee, I'm going to let him go. No, you, you sure. have to get the evidence. Of course, the, the, the context. context. It's an emergency. You know, an emergency, yeah, sometimes you have to go on a hunch. But if you've got time, you have to justify your hunch with reason. Sure. At the end of the day, reason is your tool. So, uh, of course, our subconscious does things very, very fast sometimes and, and, and very accurately. But, but we don't act on it until we understand why. Sure, yeah. Okay, well, maybe we can touch on just one last one. I'm aware of time here. Uh, the, the, the big one that Ayn Rand um, uh, showed me was that if you zoom back far enough and we sort of get the biggest abstraction, the broadest concepts, is, is that there's fundamentally uh, a battle going on between reason and mysticism, and, and it's condensed down into this, this whole struggle of ideas that we see in the political arena of between individualism, collectivism, and all this sort of stuff. How, how do you see and how, do, how have you, how have you uh, addressed this challenge in the Ayn Rand Institute of, of w without outright opposition or outspoken opposition towards religion? How do we challenge the fundamental here, this, this idea of mysticism? Perhaps we can also, um, for any listeners, quickly uh, define mysticism. I mean, yeah, mysticism is, is the belief in something w with no... Uh, no evidence. No, you know, so mysticism is the is the is acting or believing in things based on no evidence. Uh, never mind proof, but even no evidence. Um, 
you know, and the way to fight that is to advocate for a positive, which is to, to advocate for reason, to show the efficacy of reason, to show the success of reason, to show how reason is efficacious in the world. <coughs> so uh, I, I, I absolutely agree with Ayn Rand. This is the battle at the end of the day. It's an epistemological battle. It's a battle about how we know reality, how we know truth, how we think. Um, and uh, it, it is it does place us opposite religion. And there are occasions where you have to go up against religion. And, and so be it, because the fact is that religion is a problem. So therefore, you have to deal with it. I don't think you can win this battle if you shy away from the conflict, the direct confrontation with religion. I think you have to have that confrontation. Um, but it's not just religion. I mean, much of modern philosophy, whether it's postmodernism or uh, Hegel or Kant or, 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 or the existentialist, many of them are ultimately mystics, even if they're atheists. Because, you know, Plato, uh, you know, even if he even if he doesn't believe in the gods, still believe that the, the world of forms is in some other dimension. And to know the truth is to commune with that world of forms. That's mysticism. That is the negation of reality and, and our capacity to reason from reality. So, um, you know, you challenge it by showing its absurdity and by offering a positive and by showing how efficacious the positive is. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I, when I look around and see this, this it's idea of, of oneness as well, this idea that we're all one gooey, amorphous sort of uh, entity, um, which is totally contradicts everything in our real experience you know uh, if you're in a room with somebody else you just you know you're so obviously individuals are different different thoughts and you know it, it's, it's, it's a good room what about <laughs> you know, the planet sorry i don't feel them I, yeah. i'm not one with them in any sense indeed and yet this so it seems to play into you know the idea of socialism and, and collectivism it's very it's, it's to me it seems like the spiritual collectivism you know the well, idea again, of that we want attempt to justify altruism and it's an attempt and it can only be achieved through mysticism, through the negation of reason, negation of evidence and facts and reality. You know, you listen to Deepak Chopra or somebody like that, and it's mumbo jumbo. They say nothing that can connect with actual reality. And that, that's the whole point. They are, they are in, a, in, a, in a plane that is not connected to reality. And they're feeding off of the pseudo intellectual idea that that is somehow. And again, it's a plat platonistic idea that somehow this is more intellectual. This is floating abstractions that are unconnected to reality is real intellectualism. No, that's mumbo jumbo garbage. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so how, do you see, and have you seen from your experience within uh, ARI, that things are moving in, in, a, in a positive direction? Do you see uh, the, the reason prevailing over mysticism in a broader sense? Because one, one of the things that Ayn Rand pointed out to me was that, that the prevailing philosophy we can use as a barometer of, of expecting future outcomes. And uh, you know, I think she spoke of a hundred year lag or something. But yeah. so, so do you think that all those things told, are you seeing uh, encouraging signs? I think she was wrong. I think it's a two to 300 year lag, unfortunately. Uh, so I think we're still in the beginning. No, not culture wide. I'm certainly seeing more and more people engage with these ideas, more and more people interested in them. Some, uh, you know, more and more interest in, in the ideas by some of the mainstream. But the mainstream generally is still dominated by altruism and collectivism and bad ideas, even in America. And it's yeah. still moving in the wrong direction. The group of people who realize the truth is growing, but it's not yet growing fast enough and is not yet reached the level of influence enough to impact the culture in, in meaningful, significant ways. So I think it will. I think over the next few decades, we'll start seeing real substantial change. But it certainly hasn't yet. Uh, Do you think it's inevitable? Because, uh, you know, reality has that way of imposing on us. You know, we can't. Uh, we I can't do. It. I mean, I mean, nothing's inevitable. We could we could get into a nuclear war and we'll all die. So nothing's completely inevitable. But I think, yes, I think truth wins out. Reality wins out. We might have to live through another dark ages to get there. But at the end of the day, people will discover the truth. People will embrace the truth and live the truth. You know, I probably won't live to see it, but I, I, I truly am committed to the idea that it will happen because in logic, it must happen uh, again, unless unless we, we 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 completely all die off. Absolutely. And um, one of the problems I guess we face is that people tend to become so entrenched in their 
thinking, in their beliefs, their personal philosophy it tends to sort of crystallise, doesn't it? And and I don't know what age people <laughs> become fully set, as it were. In I, think, I think for people, it's 30. There are always exceptions. And, and that's why we at the Institute focus most of our efforts on young people before that sets in. Sure. Excellent. Well, that's marvellous. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Yaron, for, for you know wonderful expose. I think we've we've dealt with a number of issues there within the given time. Thank you so much for for skipping right. around so with sure. such agility. And um, where can people um, reach you these days? I think you've got your own podcast show, haven't you? Do you want to give us a few details of where you can be? I do. The best way is yaronbrookshow.com, and you can link from there to everywhere. But you can subscribe to my channel on YouTube, and you can uh, download my podcast on iTunes. And of course, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Just put in my name and, and it pops up. Uh, but yaronbrookshow.com has the links to everything. And of course, uh, importantly, you should all go to aynrand.org, A-Y-N-R-A-N-D.org. Read Atlas Shrugged, read The Fountainhead, read The Virtue of Selfishness and Capitalism and Unknown Ideal. These are the most important works written in, in the last, I think, thousand years. And, uh, and, and people really need to engage with them and study them and understand them because because your life depends on it, because your life is the most valuable thing to you in the world. And therefore, you're, you know, do it for you. Don't do it for me or for anybody else. Do it for you. Sure. And, uh, and I'd add to that that uh, some of the courses at ARI are fantastic. Some of the educational resources that you can take there, I'd uh, heartily recommend. Yeah, org slash campus is where we have all our courses and, and you can really study these ideas in depth with some of our best intellectuals, the best intellectuals in the world. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, I do hope that uh, for all of you listening, that this has helped um, explode some of those myths, address some of these really entrenched issues such as altruism and socialism. These are very, very hard ideas to, to shift in our minds. But hopefully uh, this discussion has helped along to that effort. So uh, do hope you've enjoyed the show. Please. Uh